Yeah, thank you very much. We're excited to be here. Um, Office 365 is becoming one of those necessary evils in our life where everything seems to be moving to the cloud. So our goal today is to discuss what that means, um, to kind of do a high level overview of what all is included when, and what do we mean when we say Office 365 so that we can make better decisions for how we'll use the technology ourselves and of course using the technology with our team. Um, there are lots of different um, components to Office 365. So what I thought I would do to start off with is do a super high level overview so we're all using the same um, vocabulary and then actually dive in to Office 365 and I'm going to highlight several different tools. Um, we probably won't have an opportunity to look at all of the tools and the level of detail that we'll want to today, but that's why um, all those webinars that are coming up are important. And um, we'll try to carve out a little time to go into some more detail at a later time. Um, definitely, um, if you haven't had an opportunity to hit the YouTube channel, um, that, that learning is really great, guys. And it's an opportunity for us to kind of refresh even some of the topics we talk about today, hit it up later, um, you know, rewatch the broadcast as needed. Um, this the wheel that I have on our screen um, is kind of giving us a 30,000 foot view of Office 365. So the first thing I want to do is I just want to clarify that when we say Office 365, a lot of times you see folks thinking about, well, they just mean Word and PowerPoint and Excel in the cloud. And that's cool and I, and I appreciate that there's the ability to use Word in the cloud, but I'm a creature of habit and I'm going to use the installed application. I hear that a lot. And I think one of the disadvantages um, to not having a 30,000 foot view of Office 365 is we're missing the opportunity to fully leverage the technology. So if you notice how the wheel is structured, the first outer rim of the wheel talks about something called Office Graph. And Office Graph is a really cool technology for Microsoft that actually kind of keeps a pulse on what you're using in Office 365. What I mean by that is Office knows which documents we've used recently, and it knows which team I'm on, and it understands which conversations I'm having in that team. Well, Microsoft is able to build out a mechanism that helps getting reconnected to those data points, to those documents, to those conversations easier and easier. And there are several different wedges of the wheel that will leverage Office Graph. So it's that first kind of understanding that Microsoft's goal is for Office 365, not just to move things to the cloud, but to move things in a direction that makes it easier for us to function, collaborate, work together as our goal is to get something done. So that outer rim of the wheel kind of demonstrates Office Graph, and I can go into detail on that in here in just a little bit. The next um, rim of the wheel is talking about Office Groups, and I hear a lot of different teams use different terminology here, but we're talking about the teams that we work inside of. Um, I think about Outlook back in the day when we would create distribution lists and I could group certain contacts together because those are contacts I needed to, to communicate to all at once. Um, groups is a new way to think about that. Um, you'll notice the little tagline in the wheel says it connects the right people to the right product and I think that is what gets me excited about the idea of graph and the teams or the groups that I work with is that Microsoft is going to make it easier for us to work together. So if you and I are on a team together and then maybe we're on another board together, the documents that we use across those totally separate groups, both of us can find easily. So it makes collaboration between um, documents and applications a lot easier. It becomes more seamless. Those two outer rims, they feel so abstract, they feel so um, sometimes um, they, they say it's clear as mud, but I think it'll come to more clarity if you think about how you'll leverage the graph or leverage the group or teams that you're in. If you notice, the wheel is um, kind of broken up into several different wedges. And I'm going to just do a super quick 
kind of vocabulary lesson on what this means, and then we'll get practical and we'll dive into Office 365 and I'll show you some of the really um, fun things that we can do using the technology. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is the um, giant um, orange um, wedge that says Office. So when you think about Office, I know what comes to my mind. I think about Word, Excel, and PowerPoint, and Outlook. Those are the apps that I probably use the most when it comes to Microsoft Office. And it's important to remember that all Office 365 is, is a subscription service that gives us the ability to share documents and use applications in the cloud, but it also extends the option to use those applications installed on our device. And just because we have Office 365 doesn't mean that we're forced to use an internet or cloud version of the application. We absolutely can use the installed Outlook, Word, PowerPoint like we've done for so many years. But having the documents stored in the cloud, being centrally located, and those same centrally located files are accessible by all of our other team members, it changes the way that we approach the application. It changes the way that we collaborate around documents. There's lots of different things that Office 365 will open up for us as a team as we do the day-to-day -day task that we've done for so many years. So when you see Office as a wedge, you're right. That's the standard Office apps. We just now have an option of using them installed on our local machines, or we can use internet-based or cloud-based versions of them. The wedge directly underneath it is OneDrive for Business. And OneDrive for Business is storing our documents in the cloud. Um, OneDrive is very similar to a Dropbox or a Google Drive. There's lots of different file storage options available to us where it stores our files in the cloud. The advantage of document storage in the cloud is we can access those documents from any machine as long as we have an internet connection. But there's also advantages related to version control and kind of resting in confidence that our files are always backed up and not having to worry about having any downtime. If IT needs to refresh my laptop, I can instantly gain access to my documents because they're stored centrally in the cloud. Um, so there's some really great things that we can do with OneDrive and I'll go into a lot of detail in just a little bit on that. Planner. Planner is an application that allows us to basically build a checklist. Um, Planner reminds me a little bit of project and that's Microsoft's goal that we can do kind of very light project management using the Planner app. So it is a card-based task management system, and I'll give you a demonstration of that here in just a little bit. Skype for business. Skype for business is a term that we know, right? We know Skype. Um, before it was purchased by Microsoft, it was Microsoft, it was one of the most um, leveraged voice over IP technology services. And Microsoft purchased Skype and has embedded it into the Office 365 app. They've embedded it in their Xbox, Xbox platforms. And it's a great way for us both to chat um, video conference, um, share files, there's lots of different things that Skype um, leverages as far as voice over IP technologies. Delve. Delve is a way that we can actually see Office Graph in action because what Delve is, it's a way for us to discover content and people that we're associated with. Since Microsoft, being the big brother that they are, knows the documents that we're using and the teams that we're on, it can use Delve as a way to uncover documents that may be of interest to us. If you haven't explored Delve, we'll be looking at that um, a little bit during this webinar today. Power Apps. Um, Power App is a way for us to have documents stored in the cloud and to build workflows around those documents and build our own mobile apps. I always think of Power Apps as building mobile applications without knowing or understanding code. Um, it's a really powerful feature of Office 365, and it's one of the ways that Microsoft allows us to connect lots of different files, lots of different documents, and present those in a different way. 
And those are that's a Power App is a great uh, tool set for those of us who also um, access Office 365 from our mobile device. So both your Android and your iOS device can leverage those Power Apps. Video Portal. Uh, Video Portal reminds me of YouTube without the ads, right? So it's very similar to Vimeo, and there's lots of great other sites out there where we can store um, content. But what's really great about the Video Portal in Office 365 is it fully leverages Microsoft streaming services. So it doesn't matter how long or how short our video is, Microsoft will always serve the appropriate version based on the device that I'm using. So I can have team members viewing it on their iPhone and streaming a different version over 3G, let's say, and a totally appropriate, more high quality version streamed to their laptop when they're connected via their Wi-Fi. Um, it's a great um, service. I was uh, super excited when Microsoft pulled that out of beta. Sway. Sway is one of those tools that the marketing will love. It's a way for us to piece together um, snippets of text and pictures and present it similarly that we would uh, present PowerPoint presentations, but in a way that is um, it's, it's more user-centric. It's it's that ability to tell a story simply. Um, it's one of those tools that we expect Microsoft to grow um, as our users use it more and more. OneNote, I know a lot of us are already using it. It's been a part of the Office suite um, for many, many years. And OneNote in the cloud and the um, options that are afforded us when things are stored in the cloud um, makes OneNote super exciting to use. Um, I love the fact that we can have a document shared across our entire team, take that OneNote file and maybe use it in a meeting or use it as a digital whiteboard. Um, that sh the shareability of OneNote is, is pretty awesome. SharePoint. So SharePoint is one of those um, tools that helps us collaborate. Um, we think about the way that we co collaborated in the past, we would use Outlook because we could communicate back and forth, we could attach documents to each other, um, we could create tasks for each other, we could do lots of things that would help move work forward, but when SharePoint came out several, several years ago, it gives us so many more options. So of course we could store documents there, we can build lists, we can still do um, task-based activities, but it's, I, I like to think of SharePoint as a centralized hub for Office 365, and that'll come to light in just a minute when we get into the practical side of this talk. Yammer. Yammer is Microsoft's social media platform. It's, um, it's at an enterprise level. It's very similar to a Facebook or a LinkedIn, but Yammer is designed in a way where it allows us to once again collaborate it around, around something, but with a social aspect. And for those of us who are always continually learning, we understand how important it is to pull um, an audience and not just having one person communicate knowledge to us, but to vet that knowledge or to, um, to dive deeper or just dive differently on the topic by being around other people who are using the technology. Yammer is a great way for that to happen internally. We can create a Yammer group for our teams and all the subject matter experts can post their information in a centralized location. So then we can share knowledge and, and, and kind of break outside of that more siloed approach that we see inside of businesses. So the social piece being important. The next one is calendar. And we know our Outlook calendar when we live and we die by it, don't we? Well, the calendar um, inside of Office 365, they pull it out of Outlook. Did you notice that? Because Outlook and, um, and email are two separate wedges of Office 365. So calendar and task and all of that can be done inside of the traditional Outlook application, but you also have full access to your calendar in the cloud, of course, full access to your contacts in the cloud, et cetera. And then the last one is Power BI. And Power BI is a, it's, a, it's an emerging technology. Um, it allows you to connect several different data sources together and to build interactive dashboards. Um, it is part of the Office 365 license. There are also paid versions of it. Um, there, Power BI is exciting for our team because a lot of times there's only so much you can do visually with your data only using Excel 
or only using maybe PowerPoint to lay out your charts. But there's, there's a trend right now where we want to see our data visually. And not only do I want to see the data presented beautifully to my team, but I want the flexibility of pivoting it or changing it or um, doing something different with the data on the fly. And Power BI helps the creation of those interactive, beautiful um, digital um, dashboards. And so, just as a, a quick side note, we, we just did a webinar on um, using data strategically with a bunch of examples from legal services organizations. There was a little bit of discussion of Power BI in that webinar, and it is one of the things that we're looking at doing an entire webinar focused on is data analytics and Power BI and maybe one other tool um, like Crystal or something else next year. So if that's of interest to you, definitely let us know and we'll consider it for next year's trainings. Uh, very, very good point, very good point. It's all about finding the right technologies, isn't it guys? So when you look at this wheel, you'll see lots of different options. And the truth is, I'm gonna use some of these applications differently than you will and you will use it different maybe than people on your, your very own team. So our goal is to uncover how we can be as efficient as possible. Leverage the technology to its fullest without implementing necessarily all of it. And I think that's important. Just because there's so many options doesn't mean we have to fully leverage all of them. Let's find the ones that, mean, that are meaningful to our team, meaningful to our workflow, and let's focus on those. So what I'd like to do now is I'd like to dive in and actually show you some of these. Um, like I said before, we can't show all of them, but we want to demonstrate um, as many of them as we can. So what I have pulled up on my screen right now is actually SharePoint, and that's one of the wedges of Office 365. SharePoint being the main starting point for Office 365. The URL to access um, Office 365 is just portal.microsoft.com. And once you log in, um, as IT, we can kind of control where you go, but we normally cast them into um, the Office 365 portal. So let me give you an example of that. If I go to my browser, and if I head on out to the portal, normally you'll see an experience like this. And what this is actually showing us is all of the available tiles. Now, tile is a word that we need to know, right? Especially if we have new computers with Windows 10, tiles are becoming part of our life now. And the tiles are, of course, found up here in the very top of my screen. Every single tile represents a different wedge of Office 365. From the Office 365 portal, you'd also see recently used documents. And if I scroll down, you'll see recently used OneDrive folders because Office 365 is in the cloud and it is fully leveraging OneDrive. It's making it easy. This is Microsoft Graph in play, showing us some of those recently used documents. If I scroll back up to the top, I also want you to notice that in the upper left-hand corner, there is also a menu that will show you the tiles. This menu across the top, this black bar, Office 365 bar, is persistent across the entire Office 365 platform. So as I go in and start to use different tiles, I'll always have this persistent bar across the top that allows me to get to the other tiles that I might want to leverage. So normally you're bouncing back and forth between different applications just like you would do on your computer. Now, since we're in a browser, we need to have a 30 second talk on what that means. Since we're accessing these applications inside of a web browser, browsers will potentially limit what you can do. So if your browser has um, maybe a pop-up blocker or it has um, maybe you're using an adware type um, blocker, that potentially could interfere with something opening or performing correctly. The same way that Microsoft wants us to use modern browsers with Office 365. So I always chuckled because when um, Mozilla Firefox um, kind of, when Microsoft finally killed off Internet Explorer 7, they sent them a cake to their office. So I want you to kind of remember that story when you start using older machines in Office 365. It might be time to upgrade to more modern browsers. IT handles that for us, thankfully, so 99.9% .9 of the time it's not an issue. 
but since Office 365 can be accessed from any web browser, you might be on an alternate device or at the house or somewhere else, and I don't want you to be frustrated if you're using an out-of-date browser and certain things um, do not work. Um, when all else fails, Internet Explorer is Microsoft's um, recommended browser. The truth is I use it. Um, um, uh, Google Chrome more, and I, I don't have any issues um, using Chrome or Internet Explorer with Office. So the black bar will be persistent across this little tour. So let's just start diving in and let's start exploring some things. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the core Office apps quickly. So if you notice my tiles for Word, Excel, here's PowerPoint, then secondary applications would be um, OneNote, and then where is my, oh, here it is, mail, which is another word for Outlook, right? What's different, though, is, is when you think about your mail, you have a, there's a difference between your email, which is actually the mail icon, and let me go up here to the top to see all of them, in your calendar, right? Or people, which we used to call contacts, or task. So when I think about Outlook, Outlook is actually helping us collaborate across all of these tiles. You'll also notice that um, there are lots of applications that show up on this larger tile dropdown than are presented to, to you on the portal. So I just I, I hardly ever I'm using the portal icons here. I'm usually going up to my little tile and seeing my available options and from there I'm jumping in and starting to use one of the apps. So that's what I would like to do. So let me start by jumping into, let's do Word first. So if I single click on this Word icon, I wanted you to notice that a tab opened up. So over here is the portal website that I was on. When I clicked the icon, it opened up a new tab. And I'm, I'm overemphasizing that because of my comment before about um, pop-up blockers potentially messing with it. So you'll notice um, I am inside of Word Online, so all my recent documents are over here on the left-hand side. Um, you'll notice at the very, very bottom of this blue bar, there is an option to open up um, from OneDrive for business. So if I'm storing any documents inside of my OneDrive, from that single click on the bottom, I could open up any document. You also notice underneath that, there is an option to add a place. And if I click add a place, I could actually open up from third party resources. So maybe I'm collaborating with a client who's using Dropbox or Box or any of the other online file storage locations. I can do that from the bottom. So there, there was a quick question here. Um, it, is there a browser that uh, works best or is it just any of the modern br uh, browsers will work? Yeah, that's a really good question. The one that works the best is Internet Explorer. Um, not the Edge version, but the current version of Internet Explorer. And you'd have to check me on that. I think it's version 11 um, is the current version of Internet Explorer. After that, it's in, it's probably a Google Chrome, then um, Mozilla, Firefox, then lastly is Safari. Thanks. So in addition to opening any files that I already have um, on the left-hand side, and I'm not going to do this when we go to the other applications, because this is the same in PowerPoint or in Excel, but this is recent documents, or I could open from any other location. In addition to that, you also have all of your templates. And these are templates that Microsoft um, has provided for us. So I'm going to start just from a blank template using the blank Office or um, Word document to show you quickly that Word Online, which is what we're demonstrating, um, is a simplified version of the installed version of Word. So if you compare just even mentally, like the ribbons across the top, I have Home and I have Insert, Page Layout, Review, and View. Well, if you're thinking about actual Word installed on your computer, you have a couple extra ribbons on the installed version. And that's important for us to remember. So if you're fighting using the online version, at any point in time, you can actually click in the center of the, well, it's actually at the end of the ribbon, maybe the better way to say it, is the option to edit in Word. And what that will do is it will seamlessly 
open up the Microsoft Word version, and this is the installed version of Word, and it will allow me to kind of pick up my editing using the full-blown version of Word, which cancel the sign in just for my example. But see, look, mailing and review, there's lots of different options there that were not there on the online version. And I love that ability to kind of flip back and forth um, between the online version and the installed version. Now here's something that we should mention. When you are doing um, editing inside of the browser, right, the tools that are available to us are always the newest, latest tools available for Microsoft. So that's what's really exciting about Office 365 is you're kind of moving away from the whole version game where it's like, do I have the most current version question mark and does my client have that version? There's all these problems that versions kind of introduce into the scenario. Well, using Office 365, we always have the current version both available inside the browser, but also the installed applications are always the current version. And that subscription model is what allows Microsoft to make that happen. So the first thing I'm going to recap is that remember, all of these web applications, you can bounce into the actual installed application using the link at the end of the ribbon. There's one really cool thing about typing documents inside of the browser. So here I'm typing some text, and you'll notice that if I go up to my file menu, like I would if I was using the installed version of Word, I would expect to go up there and hit save, but there is no save in the online version. It saves automatically. Yes, I know some of y'all are seeing the save as option, but you guys know what that means. Save as would save the document, but give you the option of giving it a different name, and potentially saving it in a different location. So save and save as are actually quite different. Watch um, the top of my screen. It says document one. It tells me that my document has been saved automatically. If I start typing and you watch that up at the top, so this is some more text that I'm typing, you'll notice how great to see that the Office apps online are automatically saving as you're using them. So that's a really cool feature. Um, one of the things that I get asked frequently is like, wait a minute, saved it? Like where, where is it saving this document? That is important, isn't it? So the first thing I wanna talk about is right here, next to the word save, it says document one. Just like if I was in the installed version and I used the plain template, it would do the same thing. But I can click right there and I can give it any name that I want. So I'll say, this is a test, and I'll hit enter, and that's the name of my document that's being saved. But if you look over here on the far left-hand side, it's the where it's saving. And you'll notice I'm inside of um, my account, Justin Bond, and it's being saved in my documents. And these are called breadcrumbs. So if I click on the word documents, you'll notice how it'll take me into automatically into my OneDrive for Business, and there is the document that I was just editing. I'll click on it again to pull it back up on Word Online. So, super nice, um, convenient that it's automatically saving. It's one of those things that I appreciate more and more as I use the online apps. So, let's do a super quick look at some of the other ones. I'm actually going to I'm going to come over here just to show you really quick. I am in preview mode when I click that from my OneDrive folder. So I could open in Word Online if I needed to edit, right? Because I'm just viewing it. Or I could say open it up in Word, and that would open it up in the installed version on my computer. So I wanted you to notice that. Another kind of cool feature, we'll stay here for a second, um, is once you're like previewing a document or viewing a document from your OneDrive, they give you great little actions here for I, can, I could share it out to other people in the organization. Um, that would send them a link, right, to the document inside of my OneDrive. When I share something, which really kind of cool about OneDrive, when you share something, you get to choose their level of permission on the fly. So I have this document, I want to send it to someone. Notice right here, it says anyone 
with the link can view and edit. And I would just type their names here and they would get an email and they would have a hyperlink and that hyperlink in this example would allow them to see the document, how we're seeing it, but they would also have the option to click edit, just like we do, right, as owners of the document. But if I drop down the options I can also send it as is I could say people in my organization only. So, and that's what this little option, the second one says people in my organization, or I could say, no, I need to limit it even more. So only these very specific people that we choose, they're the only ones that have view slash or edit access. If you're questioning that, whether you want them to edit, did you notice there's a little checkbox down here at the bottom? So I could say send it to specific people. If I undo allow editing, now it created a custom hyperlink for me that when I type the folks' names in here, it'll send them an email automatically with a link in this example for view only. So that, that's a really great feature of files stored um, in the cloud. In this case, we're using um, OneDrive for Business. And I'll show you a couple of the other ones really quick. Um, Copy link is pretty great too. So the idea is that I just want to quickly copy the hyperlink. And what's cool about that, let me allow access in this browser. As soon as I click copy link, it automatically copies it to my clipboard. So I don't need to come down here and hit the little copy, but same options like we saw before. So there's always like question here, like, well, wait, Justin, why is there a share versus copy? Like what's the story there? Well. It depends on our use. Like if we want to automatically send an email, yeah, use the share feature. But for me, I'm usually drafting an email to them already. So I can hop over to my OneDrive, hit copy, craft the hyperlink how I want it to look, and I'm pasting that into my email. My favorite part about copy link is the bottom option where I can set an expiration date. So I love that feature, especially when I'm doing work for clients and I you know, you have a proposal that ends at a certain date or time, or you maybe just want to restrict access to something after a certain amount of time. It's such a really cool feature. And that's the main difference for me anyways, is that expiration date on copy versus share. Okay, another option, you guys get these last two, is download and delete. So download a local copy, because remember, this document is stored in the cloud. So if I click download, it's downloading it locally onto my device. Um, there's all kinds of inherent problems with that, so we always try to break those habits with our team. Um, we encourage them to edit the documents um, in, the, in the collaborative space, the OneDrives, the SharePoints of the world, and to not have a local copy just because we don't want the document getting out of sync. Um, there's lots of conversation around that, I realize. Um, if you have questions, obviously, um, I can answer those around that. Delete, deletes. Um, the really cool thing is it automatically goes into a recycling bin. Just like if we were to delete something um, on our actual computer. So you have 30 days to recover it out of your recycling bin by default. Um, it's usually more than enough time to reverse any of those accidental um, deletion of files. Of course, there's a couple other things here talking about accessibility mode. Um, if you um, do have a need for any accessibility items, Microsoft builds it into all of their online platforms. They are fully um, 508 section compliant. So um, they um, handle all of that brilliantly for us. And of course on the left hand, or for our right hand side, it's just page navigation. So it kind of gives us a way to navigate the document. So anyways, I wanted to show you all of that really quick while we were there. Since I did open that file from my OneDrive, that's how that would look. I'm going to go ahead and actually, you know what, and close these open tabs and go back to the portal. That's the beauty of um, it opening them in tabs for us is um, the modern browser allows that to happen, right? Because tabbing is, is fairly new, last three, four years, five years probably, inside of browsers. Um, but you also can open it in its own window. It all comes down to how you click something. Like just clicking an icon automatically opens it in a tab. But in a lot of these applications, if I hold down my shift key while I click something, it'll always open it up in a new window. You see what that did? Here, I'll maximize it. So that's Word again. The only reason it opened up in a whole separate window is I held my shift key while I did the click. So the default is tab, which actually usually works really well. So let's um, very quickly look at just one more of the web apps. Let me go into um, Excel. 
I just did a single click there so it opens up in a tab. Same idea, so very consistent user experience. Left hand side, the big green bar is all of my recent documents. I also could open from OneDrive or any third party um, cloud storage. Of course, I could use any of their available templates. We'll go ahead and click the blank template again for our example. And I'm just gonna add one thing to our conversation here. The cool thing about documents um, that are stored in the cloud is multiple people can edit at the same time. Um, I can't demonstrate that today, but if you notice, I'm logged under um, my user account. So I could invite my entire team. I could maybe share the link to them or I send them an email and I copy and paste the link using the features that we just talked about. When they click the link, they would be brought to the same document online and then we all could collaborate together. Now, you, you guys understand better than anyone. Like, we both can't fight over using the same cell, but we could all be editing different parts of the document at the same time. And what's really cool about that experience in Office 365 is that every single person who's editing, we see their cursor, and every single cursor has a different color. So maybe I'll be green in this example, but you log in and you're viewing the document, yours would be a different color. And it has a little kind of um, um, little tool tip above your cursor that tells me who you are. So I can say, oh, there's Sal, and she's like doing her work over there, and there's Kim. And it's super convenient when you're um, collaborating around a document together. There are ways to prevent that too. For those of you who are curious, like in SharePoint, we could take advantage of check-in and check-out and we could prevent users from editing at the same time. So there's, there's pros and cons to this concept, I realize, and there's preventative measures we can put in place um, both to prevent it from happening and there's ways that we can help to encourage it as well. So I love the um, collaborative things that we can do related to editing documents live together. So I'm actually going to go back up to my little um, tile, just as kind of emphasizing the fact that I am in an Excel document online, but clicking the little tile, which remember the office bar is persistent across the 365 portal, and I can jump into something else. Let's jump in to Planner. Now Planner is an application that um, is really great when you're trying to build simple project management workflows. So I, I usually treat Planner like a checklist for myself and I can have um, a team and we're all working together and maybe we'll actually um, take an opportunity to get through this little tutorial, Microsoft. <laughs> Always helpful, Microsoft. Um, we can build a tiny little plan that just kind of keeps us all on the same page. So you'll notice um, in the center of my screen are all different um, plans that I'm currently working on. These could be teams I'm a part of. Um, every single team automatically can have a little planner. I wanted you to notice that Microsoft has a little ad at the top. It's kind of cool. It says planner in your pocket because there is an Android and an iPhone app for this, which is pretty awesome. But I'm going to come up here to the top and I'm going to click new plan just to show you how quickly I could create a plan. So we'll call this one our training plan. I get to choose whether it's public or private. Notice if it's public, anyone in my organization can see the plan. And that's an important word um, because Microsoft um, will eventually start um, pivoting Office 365, and you're already seeing it, but it will be available to more than just my organization. So we're seeing that in their Teams app, obviously in SharePoint, in these hyperlinks that we were creating when we shared a document, that availability of sharing and collaborating with people outside of the organization. So that's a really cool feature of Office 365, and we see Microsoft um, kind of widening the fences, how we say, right, um, as the app matures. So right now, planners just for people either inside my organization or private, and that means only members that I add can see the plan. So not everyone, but maybe just me and three of my other team members. So I'm going to make it private for now. I'm going to hit create. And you'll notice how easy Planner works. You have these little buckets across the top. So, and here is a to-do bucket. And there's, I can add as many other buckets that I want. So maybe there's a thing to do. And I can add a bucket. And these are things that I'm um, doing. 
and then maybe these are things that are done. And then what I can do is I can start adding things to these little buckets. So to do, maybe we need to um, um, build a PowerPoint template. And then there's my little card. I'm going to do one more. Um, let's say we need to um, send email um, to client. Just really simple. This one, I'll set a due date on. And then I can assign it to someone. So I'll assign it to myself. Looks good. Oops. Cooperate. Have the task. You see how this is working? So this one down here, build a PowerPoint template. It's not assigned to anyone. It doesn't even have a due date. But this one is assigned to me. And here's my little due date. And what's really cool about these is you can actually move them through whatever project management process you want to use. So in my super simple example, maybe this is something that I'm currently doing. So I can drag and drop it over to this other tab. Just cooperate Microsoft. So now I'm doing the send the email. Once I'm done, I same thing. I can move it over here to done. And it's a really simple way for as a team for us to kind of get a pulse on you know, different milestones inside of our project. Super, super simplified though. Um, you also notice they do have, in this example, I have a task and there's a little completion I could do right here. And I could say, yes, I'm done with that one. And I could complete that task. Notice, drops off the list. It's still there, right? Because I can expand this and see all the tasks that I've completed. So there's several different ways for you to leverage this as a team. So it's really, really fun. Um, it's one of the things that we're getting excited about using it even internally as a team, just staying organized on, on high level milestones. But for clarification's sake, the view you're looking at right now is called the board. And you'll notice at the top, I'm, I have the board selected, but you also have a chart. And if you look at this, a yeah, very graphical way to kind of view the status and all your members and what tasks have been assigned or not assigned. And we treat this as a burn down chart. Um, for those agile project managers in the room, it's a super quick way for us to kind of get a pulse on any project. And it's built in to Office 365. So that's a super simple example. I'm going to go back up to my tile and let's look at a couple more together. I'm going to come down here and I'm going to do OneNote. So a lot of us have already been using OneNote on our computers and it's getting better and better and introducing it into Office 365 is pretty awesome because uh, now what we can do is see um, all of our documents stored online automatically. So if I want to share or collaborate with you on one of these documents, the complicated part of making sure that it's shared um, is done. So that's like really, really awesome. So you'll notice I have my recent notebooks. Of course, here is um, my notebooks, um, recent notice could be um, documents that are, or notebooks rather, that are stored in my space or documents that are shared. So here's a couple um, that are project based or they're actually from client sites. And then here's an example of one that's personal. So, and that's what's important is that um, you can use OneNote just for yourself. And for those of you who are like, wait a minute, what, well, I don't even know what this is. What is, what in the world is OneNote? OneNote is just a digital notebook, and it's a way for you to stay organized. What's cool about OneNote, and I, I know the, the comparison everyone always makes is, well, wait a minute, is this like Evernote? Well, yes, it is. It's similar to Evernote. Um, it's that flexibility of being able to store anything. I want a little notebook and store links that I visit regularly, or I want a notebook that stores all my notes from my project. Or I want to be able to like draw something out. I want to sketch something out really quick on my surface. OneNote is a way for you to do that instead of fighting the manual way that we create notes, right? Like we'll launch Microsoft Word during a meeting and take our notes in Word. And then we're bound to the margin space in the document. Or we're in Excel trying to make a checklist. And then we're frustrated because we have to organize rows and columns. Or we are in a meeting and we're trying to present a drawing in PowerPoint and then we're limited to using the inking controls in presentation mode 
and then frustrated because we didn't tell it to keep our ink. Well, OneNote kind of combines all of that technology into one, and it gives you that availability of having like an organizational structure too, which is really awesome. Like if you just look at this little example of this personal notebook, over here, um, and you'll notice, it's going to cooperate with me, I'm going to, I'm going to stay right here, hold on one second, let me get my go to meeting controls out of the way, there we go. So what's really kind of cool about this is I can insert any drawing. So I don't have to use PowerPoint for this. What's really cool is even have like fun like little stickers that make things a lot easier as you're building something out. And of course, some of them are absolutely ridiculous. Um, you also, if you notice my drawing tab, like very intuitive drawing tools, especially if you have a surface or um, a, any, any device, doesn't have to be a surface, any device that you can draw with your hand, right? Or a stylus. So you can do that on your iPhone or your Android because there is a, a great OneDrive mobile app that you can use. Um, you'll also notice from the home ribbon, I can actually type um, anything that I want. So maybe this is a training page. And notice I can click right here at the top. This is text. But I also could come down here further, and I can click down here. This is more text. Like I'm not bound to margin space. So I can do a lot of really creative things as they start taking notes. Since we have the shareability of a OneNote document, I love being able to store this in my One um, Drive for Business folder or share it out in SharePoint. And then I can have multiple people in the document at once. So it's a great little app. Um, if, for those of you who have never explored it, what I recommend doing is looking at it um, installed on your computer. So if I, if I just open OneNote on my computer, what I love about it is they actually give you a tutorial on how to use it. So if you've never used it before, it's a great starting place. You'll notice they have a little tab across the top that says Quick Notes, and that's your kind of little training guide on how to fully leverage it. Of course, when you're done, you can delete that one, or you can just go through the process of adding your own tabs. All color-coded. I mean, so much potential here inside of OneNote. If you haven't explored it, it's definitely something you should explore in your Office 365 subscription. Okay, very good. So let's clean up a little bit. I'm closing Planner, closing OneNote. Back in the Office portal. I'm going to come up here to my tiles again, and I'm going to look at the Outlook components really quick. So we're not going to spend a ton of time here, but the idea would be that the mail icon is your web mail. So some of us in the old days remember Outlook Web Access. This is that idea, right, that I can be in a browser and can access my email. Everything that you can do in Outlook, you can do inside of your browser. What's really, really slick about your mail is that all your folder structure, any rules that you've created, like all the things that you do in Outlook related to your inbox, it applies. So it's really, really great. The only frustration that I hear from folks is when they use the app on their phones. A lot of times the folders don't display how we want and we're frustrated by um, some of the things that Apple makes us do related to tasks. Um, but for the most part, the trick is, if you're gonna commit to using Office 365, then you need to use the Microsoft apps and not any third-party apps. So Microsoft does make um, a mail, a calendar app, um, for all the mobile devices, for those of you who choose to use it on your phone. So we're talking about the browser experience today, so you can kind of imagine that. Um, I'm not going to go into my mail, but I will go into my calendar just to show you this would be um, very similar to your Outlook calendar, and all of your calendars will be listed across the top, so I can close and open calendars. Um, I can even add calendars, just like I would do inside of the installed version of Outlook. Um, this is all inside of my browser. Um, you'll notice on the left-hand side of my screen would be um, any other people's calendars that I've already subscribed to in Outlook. Of course, what's really cool about Office 365 is every team that I'm on is also presented. And I'm using the word team and group um, interchangeably today. Um, so any group or team that I'm on, they also have their own calendars. And of course, there's a little training calendar 
that we talked about just a little bit ago. So it's really, really great. Um, there's a lot of things about um, Office 365 that you'll start to appreciate more and more as you use it. So I know it's super simple, but if you look here, um, today is the 11th, and there is actually weather um, built in to the application. So it's given me, you know, a little five-day forecast um, kind of based on my location. And don't you love that? The fact that we can be anywhere in the world and, you know, all of the stuff is happening auto-magically for us. Time zones are updating. It's giving me current weather based on my geolocation. Really exciting things. So that's a very simple example. Show you people really quick too, because I don't want you to miss these Outlook components. Another thing that you can view is your contacts. And what's really, really great about this screen, um, notice it says choose um, how you see people. Microsoft realizes that we all use these apps differently. So it's giving me the option of actually like kind of pivoting the view that I would have as I use you know, the calendar, or in this example, the contacts. So you're seeing people that I recently have communicated with. It's kind of given me information um, about my last contact with the individuals. Um, notice I could have um, people on whichever calendar I chose. Um, I could have people um, on my calendar displayed. I also could have some favorites, which you don't have set up yet. And there's an important little thing to kind of notice is this little pin icon which we're getting used to this in Office 365, aren't we? It's all over the place. And you'll see I can actually pin any of these to my view. And that will make sure that this view will always be one of the first things that I see. Here's another example of that. If I go ahead and launch Word, this is the installed version of Word. But if you'll notice, over here is my recent um, documents. If I hover over these, there's also a little push pin here. And that just means that document will always be pinned or available for me to use. So it's part of all of Office 365. Okay, of course, look at the left-hand side. You'll see all of the groups that I'm a part of because groups have different teams. So if I go into one of my teams, let me see who's part of this client project. You can see all the members of, the, of that particular group. Um, you also will see that I have um, all my contacts, which I don't use, um, Outlook contacts. We use a different CRM for our contacts, but if I did, I would see them all there, in addition to the entire organizational directory. Okay, I'm going to keep moving forward then. So the mail, the calendar, and the people are all parts of Outlook. And then here's the last one, it's task, which is also an Outlook function. So if you all have used that in Outlook or are currently using it, all of your tasks will pull forward to this um, tile as well. What's really cool about task is you're seeing them used um, more frequently. Um, you saw our example of planner when we were creating the task and I assigned it to myself. Well, that would automatically create a task that would sync to my Outlook, of course, it would be available here too. So there's lots and lots of different things that are available to us both online and inside of our um, Outlook application. So these four. Okay, so let's get into some of the other ones. Like those are ones that for the most part we should be familiar with. I mean, outside of maybe Planner, but the other ones we have exposure to. So what are some of the other options? So the first thing that I'm gonna look at is Delve. So if you notice, I've hit my tile. I'm going to come down here and find Delve. You may have accidentally gotten to Delve um, because if you're ever in SharePoint and you hover over a user's name and you click their username, it'll also take you um, to Delve. So what this is actually showing me is all of um, my interactions with other team members. So this is leveraging Microsoft Graph. So it knows which teams I'm on. It knows who I'm sending emails to and who I'm editing documents with, et cetera. And it's presenting that to me. So instead of me having to remember the saved location, I could go to Delve and I could start to use it to uncover these documents. But it also goes a step further. It kind of helps you uncover, right? So if I come over here and look at the people, these are all the folks that I've 
uh, have been interfacing with. So if I choose one of the users, we'll use Rick as an example. Now I'm seeing Rick's Delve profile. Kind of gives me his information, kind of shows me a high level, um, his calendar, and it also shows me documents that he and I have recently sent back to each other. Of course, I could scroll down because I like how this part works. It says discover documents from people around Rick Miller. So what this means is it, Microsoft Graph understands that I'm working with Rick on something, but it also knows that there are potential other documents that maybe Rick and another staff member are using together that also are important to me, although I potentially wasn't looped in. Now there's, there's always like that fear question right here. It's like, wait a minute, that seems a little too big brother for me. Like Rick should be able to have a personal conversation with someone and I shouldn't like be looped in. You're right. The only reason it's looping me into these people around Rick are these are folks on my same team in the same shared folders that both of us use. So it's never exposing sensitive data. If you have data that's locked down, if you have um, proprietary documents maybe stored in a SharePoint library with permissions set up correctly, you will not expose those to Microsoft Graph and you will not have to worry about team members uncovering them. Here's a perfect example. So Raymond Rothberger is my boss. So you'll even notice over here, there's a little organizational chart and you'll see my name and then directly above um, me is Raymond. And I am only seeing documents that I have access to. I'm not seeing any of the documents related to his, any of his other staff members. I'm not um, being exposed to things I shouldn't have access to. I'm only seeing documents that Raymond and I collaborate on or documents related to teams that Raymond and I are on or documents in the same shared locations that both of us have access to. So I, I, I know there's a lot of sometimes confusion around Delve and there's always this kind of impulse like let's just turn it off, um, which is an option, but I do see some value in it. And if you use it well, it's only going to get better and better. If you leverage groups and you work inside of all of these shared folders, you can expect this experience um, to even get more rich than it already is. So trying to give you a super high level of some of these other technologies, technologies that always get kind of skipped over um, as Microsoft rolls them out to us. That was Delve. Right next door to Delve is video. And this is like one of the ones that's, that's newer and I was super excited um, when it came online. Um, we're trainers, so we do a ton of training and we use lots of different video services and some of them are so, so costly. Um, it's, it's exciting to see Microsoft do video-based storage. Um, I won't go into a ton of detail on this today. If you all have exposure to um, Vimeo or YouTube, you'll be familiar with Microsoft Video. It's a place for you to store documents. Um, you can divide your, um, your documents or videos in this example into channels. So you'll notice um, there's a channel button right here. And you can build as many different channels as you want. So just think category, right? So you can maybe have a channel for training and maybe another channel for, um, I don't know, office party highlights or another channel for something else. And then you can just upload the videos into those different categories channels, uh, which makes it easier for your um, folks to find. So if I click the little upload, I just wanted to show you, um, you can literally upload um, any video type um, and Microsoft will automatically convert it um, and make it fully web ready. And I know that seems, um, it's hard for me not to go into detail on that because I'm so passionate about the web technologies, but that is awesome, guys, that we can record something on our Mac, upload it as a dot, you know, an MP4, and then our Windows users can still view it, right? Or I can be on my phone and it streams an appropriate version to my phone. So it's a really cool service. It's super quick. Um, there, there are limitations as far as file storage um, because every single Office 365 user um, has X number of storage available to us. IT configures that. Um, it's enormous though, by default. I would even have to look it up because um, even as trainers, I mean, I have trainers that are uploading 
dozens of videos today and have never reached their maximum quota. So it's, an, it's a very generous amount of storage by default. Of course, Microsoft I mean, is more than willing to sell us more storage should we ever need it. So, but there is, there is, a, there is a limit which we can look up if needed. So video is super exciting. Um, once you have a video uploaded, which here, I'll just I'll show you. So here's a channel and here's um, a video right here. Um, I'm not going to click on it because I don't want to like start playing the video. But what's, what's interesting about um, the video is you get all these little thumbnails. And then when you click on the video, which let me see if it'll, I can pause it really quick. Um, oh, oh, it's because I'm, I'm in the webinar. Um, good. And that's because I want to start playing. Um, wh what I don't want to be able to um, do is ever limit my users. So what's really cool about uploading a video and, and viewing it in the browser is you can do really cool things um, on other platforms like send an email campaign and include that video in your email campaign or host a video inside of Microsoft Video and embed it in your corporate website, right? And you'll notice kind of towards the bottom of my screen, um, it kind of tells us who uploaded it and you put description information, but there's a download button where they could download an appropriate version of it because maybe they're going to do something with it locally or there's an embed and I could then just like I would do a YouTube or a Vimeo video, couldn't embed it into any other um, website. Of course, I love that email option. So that's where we use it the most. Where what we'll actually do is record videos, um, and instead of trying to type a complex technical email to someone, we'll just record ourselves doing it. Load it up into Microsoft Video, and then send them a video um, via email. They get a hyperlink. They can click on it, and they can view that maybe very technical thing more as a screencast. So it's a lot of fun. We love it. That's a video option. Let's um, let's look at another obscure one. One that I wish was used more. Um, it's sway. It's storytelling. Um, if you've been in my any of my other sessions, you know how much I love PowerPoint. It's like one of my favorite apps. There's so much you can do inside of PowerPoint. But what's interesting about PowerPoint is that we have to, we're responsible for making sure we're doing amazing storytelling. And what I always notice is that when folks are um, creating their own story, they get kind of that white uh, or blank canvas kind of, um, <laughs> kind of anxiety where it doesn't have to be that hard. Well, what's awesome about Sway is if I come up here and I create a new one, it's going to like step me through the storytelling process. And I love that. And it's going to make it super easy to have like beautiful looking slides or stories. Um, and it's, what's awesome about it is what, once you're done, you get to choose like what you're going to do with your document. Like maybe you're not going to print it, but that's an option. You could print it. Or maybe you're going to present it um, in your SharePoint site. You can maybe present a little web part on your homepage of your intranet. There's all these like really, really cool things that you can do. So you'll know this. It's kind of, kind of fun how this works, but if you look at the right-hand side of the screen, there's all of these cards that I can put in. So you'll notice there's like headings and there's all kinds of different media that we could do. And that's like images or video or audio, but look at the fourth one. I also could embed. So I could maybe embed a video from a YouTube channel or some other source, any other third-party source, pretty awesome. Of course, you can present it differently by doing different ways that we group parts of our story. So there's stacks and comparisons and little slideshows and grids. And all that these are is super awesome. You use a single click and it adds them to our little storyboard. And then we can drag and drop them and position them differently. And what's really kind of fun, and we just do a couple more. Let's do a heading. We're responsible for making sure, you know, that we still do the storytelling, right? So I can add a, this part of the story is, um, here, I'll just keep it simple. This is, um, we love Sway. And then I can actually drag this wherever I want it. And then maybe here, I'm gonna add some content. So what type of content? And look at all these great things that we can do here. So. These are like the, like the Microsoft templates at the top. And on the bottom, of course, could be any of our content. Notice that content could be stuff that's stored locally, 
right? Or stuff we have stored up inside of our OneDrive for business. So for right now, I'm just going to put in, um, you know, I'll just go to backgrounds. We'll throw in this background. No, looks good. And I can put a little caption. This. Just so we have some, some information. We can actually choose um, a focus point, which is kind of fun, because if the image is super large, like we can actually choose what part is visible. And that's important, because if you look at what they're showing us right here, um, this is going to look great on a computer screen or a tablet, but it's automatically going to scale it down for consumption on a smaller screen, like in a mobile device. And setting the um, part that's important becomes important because I want it to be able to say that's the part that I want to focus on. Um, so when I view it on a smaller screen, it makes sure that part is visible. I think it's super awesome. So I will let that one be. Um, you also can do like really cool things um, related to after this is all said and done. Here, I'll come up here and just show you super quick. There's all these other designs that we can produce. And so this, this opens up some things for us. It also makes our heads spin. So I've seen a couple of team members like think, wow, there's just so many options. Like I don't even know where to start. And I have the other side of that coin, which is the marketing guys. And they're like, wait a minute, this doesn't match our, our corporate branding. I get all of those things, right? But I, I get excited that Microsoft gives us options, right? Where maybe you don't have to be a full blown designer to be able to present content in a logical, beautiful way for your audience. And that's what it's doing for us. And if you need to follow corporate branding, then yes, you're not going to use one of maybe their, their stock, but you'll start with maybe stock artwork and then customize it. And during that customization step, make sure that you're not using their colors, but you know, making it match your own. So anyways, Sway is a very interactive way um, to build um, out a story or um, tell a story when you're all said and done. Two quick things that have come through on the questions. One was just pointing out that the storage is um, one terabyte plus uh, uh, half uh, 0.5 gigabyte per user. Uh, that sounds right. Yep. And then additionally, there was a question over with Sway, um, can you add things like native charts, tables, that type of stuff? How much flexibility do you have? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, the answer is yes, all of those things. Um, the only thing is that Sway is not interactive. So once you get it presented, um, it's kind of, it feels static, if that makes sense, in the sense that I can't pivot the data, but that's a good business case for Power BI. So a lot of times I'll create a hyperlink inside my Sway that would link out to a more interactive dashboard. Sway is emerging too. Like this is a brand new app. Um, so Microsoft always produces really great learning around any of these um, new um, applications. So if you notice in the upper right-hand corner of my screen, I can create a brand new Sway document um, since I'm inside the Sway tile, but there's also all of Microsoft's tutorials available to us as well. Um, and the reason that's important is they're constantly adding to it. So a lot of the things um, that we want to do inside of Sway, um, example, like we start in PowerPoint, realize that it's taking us too long, we want to pick it up inside of Sway. Well, there's even an option, instead of creating from one of Microsoft's templates, is to start from a document. And that could be your PowerPoint document or you know, whatever document you started your presentation in. I just don't want to use that word because like it's more than presentation. I feel like it, for me personally, it feels different than a, a standard PowerPoint presentation. Definitely something I'd, I'd ask that y'all explore. Depends on audience, depends on our needs, but it's definitely something that's a lot of fun. Okay, I'm gonna have a couple more. Um, the next one that I would like to um, look at is if I come down to my tiles, I'm going to go to flow really quick. Flow is a way for Office 365 to interact with other third party applications. Um, I'm just going to do a super kind of quick definition of flow. Um, 
and I would ask that you always check with IT before you do anything, right? Because they're the ones that are smarter than all of us when it comes to understanding like what we're exposing ourselves to, right? They do a really good job of that. So, but the reason I'm, I'm kind of giving that little disclaimer is Flow would allow you to build your own workflow, that's what Flow is short for, right? A workflow that leverages any other service. So example, and you can kind of see their little, they even have some little examples at the top. So this little workflow says that it saves an Office 365 email attachment to OneDrive for Business automatically. So that email comes in, it has an attachment, it automatically saves it to your OneDrive for Business. So workflows are designed to make things happen more quickly for us automatically. So there's the next example right next to it. It says start approval when a new item is added. So in this example, it's gonna use a little SharePoint template. So it's using actually a SharePoint list, which I know there's probably a lot of us leveraging this already, but anytime that event is added or that document or list item is added to the library or list, it can automatically kick off a workflow asking the item to be approved. We can fully customize the email that gets sent out, we can fully customize the task that is generated by that workflow, and we can kind of, kind of customize it to meet our need along the entire workflow. But there's great templates and starting places, which I don't um, want to go too far into it, but if I just want to scroll down a little bit to show you the popular services, do you see it's not just Microsoft? So I could say, I want something, maybe it, when I create a note in my OneDrive, I automatically wanted to update my wonder list, which is down here, actually, wonder list. Or every time I create a calendar event in my XYZ calendar, add that event automatically to this client-facing Google calendar. Or automatically do something in Slack or update my Trello board. I mean, there's so many third-party services that enter act with Microsoft. This guys is exciting um, because we're talking about big data now. We're talking about it being more than just a static document stored in some server in some location in our basement. We're talking about documents that are truly collaborative, that are cross-platform, and that ability to leverage them fully. And it's super exciting. We're living in, in a time where we have an opportunity to do some really creative things with how we use data, kind of breaking out of that static kind of document-based format that we've been so used to. So Flow is short for workflow. It's a great place for us to build workflows that work both inside of the Office 365 platform, but can be extended to many of the other um, partners that Microsoft is linking arms with. And you're seeing lots of examples here. So a uh, quick question. Is Sway just a more elaborate version of PowerPoint? How is it, uh, is it just the templates that make it different? Yes, yes, that's a good question. It's um, yes and no. Um, it's different in your delivery. Um, normally when PowerPoint, the way PowerPoint is structured, it naturally causes us to go down, slide to slide to slide to slide to slide. So our storytelling feels um, more um, one dimensional, where Sway gives us the opportunity to cluster our, um, our data points or the parts of our story into different ways. Um, and it doesn't have to feel like a presentation. Microsoft's main goal being um, we're all kind of like PowerPointed to death. So it's another way to present content, but it's focus being storytelling, not necessarily presenting a chart, presenting a graph, but presenting a chart and a graph and wrapping it in context and having, like you said, templates available to help control the mood of the story, or is there audio and video that's playing behind it? So I want you to, I don't want you to picture it as much as PowerPoint as I want you to picture it as, and I mean this loosely, but more video kind of editing. Yeah, well, uh, William Guyton makes a really good point that the uh, transforms between slides are very good. It's, it's designed really to create that visual medium where PowerPoint was not originally designed for that. And uh, this it's just right on point there. Yep. 
Okay, we have just about 10 minutes left. Um, I'm going to do a couple quick things. Uh, obviously, we're, we're, we welcome all of your questions, um, too. So let me try to cover, cover a couple other quick things, and then let's get these questions in, too. Um, so I'm going to go back up to my tile. And um, I just want to quickly um, call out definitions for um, Yammer. And I'm also going to do um, one for Teams, which I don't even see now that I'm wanting to see it. Uh, oh, right here, Teams. So definitions. Yammer and Teams are two ways that we can collaborate outside of SharePoint, right? SharePoint being normally the main hub of collaboration. But Yammer, if I could actually I'll go ahead and click on Yammer. Yammer is like a social media platform. It feels a lot like Facebook. Um, we can send out posts, we can like them, um, we can organize um, into groups, just like Facebook organizes into groups, but it's enterprise level. It, it's not designed to be shared with everything outside of the organization. It's designed for our organization only. But that's not the only way that we can collaborate. Teams is another way to do it. Now, Teams is, it's kind of like mashing up what Skype and SharePoint do for us. Microsoft Teams, 90% of the time, is used as a chat system. So the goal would be is that you could build out as many different groups or teams that you want, and then as you're inside, and I'll just click on one of these, as you're inside of a group, all the conversation and dialogue, the files that we share together as a group, it's in a centralized location. So yes, it's a lot like Skype and the fact that we can chat back and forth about something. It's also a lot like SharePoint because it fully leverages our SharePoint libraries and lists. So you'll notice I have a little section up top of this group called SharePoint. That would be all the libraries where documents are stored for this team. It also has a dedicated OneNote notebook so our team can have a centralized place to keep notes and it also has a files section, and that would be an extension of SharePoint again. It would be normally it's a library directly related to this team. In my example, the customer experience team, the SharePoint link would be any other libraries that we want access to. Um, it also takes in some other components of Skype, and then we can do virtual meetings with each other. So I can start a chat conversation, and I can chat with anyone in my organization. But I also can say, you know what, I want to screen share with this person, or I want to start a meeting with this person, and you can do it all virtually. And it works super slick. If you've done it in Skype or you've used GoToMeeting or GoToWebinar, these other applications, they're all very similar. But this is geared today for our organization only. Microsoft is going to release sometime in this last quarter teams for people outside of our organization, where then we can start leveraging um, SharePoint and chat and video conference, all of these things with our clients using the 365 platform. So we're super excited about it. Um, we actually use it heavily um, in our organization. Um, the feature we use the most is chat. Um, really quick um, kind of victory is email becomes overwhelming sometimes with the volume alone. So being able to set an expectation that, you know what, if you need me immediately, hit me up in chat and we use teams of course to do that um, of course skype for business can be hooked into it as well um, but it kind of solves the problem of sending an email and waiting to see did that person get to that email yet um, oh i forgot to send their read receipt on that thing and it solves a lot of those problems that we have in traditional kind of communication using out only it's something to explore um, the thing that will confuse you the first time you launch teams is that it does work inside of groups so it's going to want you to establish groups first once groups are established you add people to those groups and then those groups can communicate together so it's not like Skype where you have its contact first and then you can kind of lump them together um, teams does work in that kind of group model first um, there's great video tutorials on how to leverage teams um, that's something that I recommend um, that you explore. I just about five minutes um, left. Um, I'll reserve the last couple minutes for questions, absolutely. But the last thing I wanted to um, demonstrate, if I go back up um, to my tile, um, is Microsoft 
will add and remove from this list actively. Um, Microsoft recently added this little guy down here, Microsoft Dynamics 365. And the reason I'm mentioning this in closing is just because something is presented to you um, inside of your tile list does not mean that we're licensed to use it. Microsoft will always give us a free trial to something. And one of the pushbacks that I have on 365 is um, when they release something like Microsoft Dynamics, which is an amazing CRM. But when you click on um, Dynamics 365, I'm not licensed to use 365. So what it's actually going to do is um, ask me actually to sign up for it. <laughs> So that is something that's kind of, it's been frustrating for our team. So I just wanted to bring, uh, make you aware of that. Uh, we noticed a change in Power BI. Um, Microsoft recently changed licensing for that as well. Um, I'm gonna click off of that before it goes into that. Um, Microsoft Teams, I'm sorry, uh, Microsoft um, Power BI was always free. Um, but now they have a free version where we only have X number of data storage. I think it's one gigabyte, which is enormous for Power BI, um, and if you need any more storage than that, then you have to subscribe to service. So I just mentioned that because I think there's confusion sometimes. Just because we see an icon doesn't mean we have full, maybe full access to something. In closing, I would um, encourage you to explore. I would encourage you to approach the technology without fear. Um, Microsoft is constantly changing the technology. It's kind of, um, the world that we live in now, so I encourage you to always explore and share your knowledge with those around you. Um, take advantage of the webinars that have been recorded on the YouTube channel um, and kind of use those as a refresher and a reminder um, as you guys start using your technology to its fullest.